Well, good afternoon, everybody. It's great to be back with you for another virtual town hall. We have a great guest. Dr. Andrea LaCroix is with us from UC San Diego. There's so much that I'd like to cover. I think first and foremost, I just want to encourage everyone uh, to turn in their ballot for the upcoming recall election on September the 14th. And uh, the ballots have dropped. They've been mailed. Uh, you should be receiving your ballot soon and vote no and send in your ballot. Uh, so with that out of the way, I'm looking forward to uh, answering your questions. We've got a ton of good questions uh, this week, and uh, I want to just very briefly share some of the work that we're doing for you in Congress, where we are delivering on several key priorities for the people. First, I want to talk about COVID-19. You're probably familiar with the American Rescue Plan, which we passed back in March. Uh, and I want to underscore two pieces in that bill that have particularly uh, helped get Californians and help get our district's residents back on their feet. That's shots in arms and money in pockets. In terms of shots in arms, we now have over 166 million Americans who have been fully vaccinated. Uh, we can hug our families again. We can uh, now uh, see the light at the end of the tunnel. And that light, of course, is to get everyone else vaccinated. So I hope uh, that if there is even one additional person by virtue of watching today that can talk to a loved one or a family member, or a friend or a coworker, or a colleague. And if you can implore them to please get vaccinated, that will be well worth the while of putting on today's virtual town hall. And for goodness sake, if you still need to be vaccinated, please uh, get vaccinated as quickly as you can. And I think the president and the administration working with Democrats in Congress and the House and Senate have done a fine job of spreading that word. We're also delivering to help those in need with direct cash payments, $1,400, you might recall, that went out as a result of the American Rescue Plan. And now the uh, biggest middle class single year tax cut for families in the history of the United States uh, in this Biden child tax credit. The second payment of the uh, middle class tax cut went out yesterday, as a matter of fact. Uh, and if you have children, uh, I hope that you check your bank account because hopefully you got a child tax credit payment uh, as part of the American Rescue Plan. We're talking about $300 per month for kids, uh, six and under, $250 per month for kids seven through 17. This is a huge deal for the families of the 49th district. About 69% of the families in the district will be able to take advantage uh, of this middle-class tax cut. It'll help 125,000 children in our district and lift 10,300 children out of poverty. Truly remarkable. Another key feature of the American Rescue Plan was money for many of our restaurants, many of our small businesses, and for our shut shuttered performance venues. And I was really proud to announce about $19 million to 28 venues. Uh, this is entertainment venues, theaters, museums, this is through something called the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant Program. So 19 million for 28 venues in North County, San Diego and South Orange County to help cover things like payroll, rent, mortgages, worker protection and other qualified expenses. And it's gonna help ensure that all of the venues that we cherish throughout our district and beyond will be able to make it through and serve our community. Uh, in addition, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund just yesterday uh, I was with one of our uh, great restaurants uh, in the district that received about $150,000 in the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. Uh, it has really helped a lot of our local restaurants as well. Uh, let me be very clear about something. Turning the economy back on from one of the worst public health crises in the history uh, of the United States isn't like a light switch. But uh, make no mistake, we were in a 10 million jobs hole when President Biden took office a little over seven months ago, and four million of those jobs have now come back. And it's my objective, and I know the objective of many of my colleagues in Washington to ensure that we get all the way back to full employment as quickly as we can. But it's not, again, it's not like a light switch. There is some price uptick in places. It will be a bumpy road at times, but our priorities are intact. We see that growth projections for long-term economic growth are up, Wages are up, unemployment is down, and we can all be proud of that. Also, we have to remember in terms of vaccinations uh, that COVID and specifically the Delta variant, and Dr. LaCroix will be speaking to this in just a minute, it is a very real 
uh, problem in our communities right now. Over the past week, an average of roughly 124,200 coronavirus cases has been reported every day in the United States. That's an increase of 86% from just two weeks ago, 86%. The number of new deaths reported is up by 75%. Now it's an average of 552 deaths per day for the past week. What I'll say also in San Diego County, the most recent data suggests that of those who are getting seriously ill, it is a 50 to one ratio, the unvaccinated versus the vaccinated, the overwhelming, obvious reality is that if you get vaccinated, you are far less likely to get sick, certainly far less likely uh, to wind up in the hospital uh, or pass away as a result of COVID-19. So it is another important reminder of how we've got to listen to public health experts. We've got to listen to science. The vaccine is safe. It's effective. It's free. It's readily available. So please get the vaccine. Have all your friends, your family who are eligible get the vaccine. Next, I want to talk about how we're delivering on health care. What you may not know is that in the American Rescue Plan, there were some very significant improvements to the Affordable Care Act. As part of the ACA or part of the rescue plan, we dramatically reduced ACA premiums and deductibles. And so far, over 2 million people have signed up through the ACA during the extended open enrollment period. The federal open enrollment period ends tomorrow, but Californians have until the end of the year to sign up for coverage by visiting coveredca.com. And what you can do is you can go on there and very quickly you can say how much money you make and you can learn how much your premiums would be. And the reality is for many California households, you can get health care through Covered CA for a dollar a month, a dollar a month. So please check it out. There's around 1.6 million Californians who are getting their care through Covered California, and I hope a lot more will sign up between now and the end of the year. And we're trying to make those uh, improvements to the ACA. We're trying to make the uh, child tax credit permanent, permanent, so that we eliminate as much uh, childhood poverty and as many people without health insurance as possible in the United States. That'll yield far more significant long-term economic benefits than it will have short-term costs. We're also in the process of delivering when it comes to climate change and when it comes to the clean energy jobs of the future. And for me, as a member of the House Select Committee on the Climate Crisis and the House Natural Resources Committee, of course, that means things at the global and the national level, but it also means things at the local level, such as making the cleanup of the nuclear waste at San Onofre a top federal priority. I recently launched a bipartisan spent nuclear fuel solutions caucus to drive progress on the safe storage, transportation, and disposal of spent nuclear fuel across the country. Because I've said many times, and continues to be true, that the the spent nuclear fuel at San Onofre is the symptom of a greater problem, which is that we have nowhere to send it. In fact, we have nowhere to send any of the nation's spent nuclear fuel from commercial power plants across the United States. That is what we aim to address with our caucus. And I'll, for as long as I have the honor to serve, will prioritize getting the waste off our coast at San Onofre, off the coast as quickly and as safely as I possibly can. With it uh, uh, now being uh, almost the month of September, there has been a ton of discussion about infrastructure. And I'm really pleased to see the Senate pass the bipartisan infrastructure deal, which has a huge amount of uh, good in it for our district and for our country. Uh, You probably, uh, if you've been following, you know that the American Society of Civil Engineers gives the United States a C minus when it comes to our infrastructure. That is 13th in the developed world. And we certainly need to do a whole lot better than that. And the bipartisan infrastructure deal makes a historic investment, over a trillion dollar investment in our roads, our bridges, our water, our uh, sanitation, uh, all of the uh, uh, rural broadband that we're going to need, uh, all of it. Uh, I think is uh, really overdue. Our ports, our airports, all of it included in that bipartisan plan. But the bipartisan plan, as good as it is, doesn't go far enough in terms of its investments in climate, uh, trying to uh, electrify transportation, trying to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from power generation, uh, trying to crack down on pollution uh, from around the world. And that's where we've got to get that uh, budget resolution across the finish line as well that reconciliation bill, for those that have been following, you've got your bipartisan bill, 
uh, that uh, passed the Senate 69 to 30. And then you've got what's called the reconciliation bill, which in addition to having a lot of climate and energy provisions has other things in there like paid leave, free community college, the uh, expansion of the child tax credit that I mentioned before, and so much more. We've got to get both across the finish line. And when it comes to climate, if you have heard or read anything about the new IPCC report, the United Nations Climate Report, which comes out every handful of years, uh, the Secretary General of the UN has now called this a code red for humanity. Code red for humanity. What I have said, we'll continue to say, is that not only do we need to address the climate crisis because it's what we must do to, to protect our planet, but if we do it effectively, it will also be one of the key catalysts for economic growth in the 21st century. And I want for the United States to lead the world. I want our district, our region to lead the world when it comes to creating the clean energy jobs of the future. And I will not stop fighting until we've actually passed legislation and get it to Joe Biden's desk where he signs it in a law that will address the climate crisis with the seriousness that the science demands. That's what we're going to do in Washington, D.C., as long as I have the opportunity to influence uh, the outcome. Finally, we're advancing uh, key funding legislation through this process that will directly benefit our district, key projects, key priorities. $9.3 million to shore up Coastal Bluffs in San Clemente, $5 million for pedestrian infrastructure in Carlsbad, two and a quarter million dollars to develop a new homeless shelter in Oceanside, and four other community projects for a total of $21 million in funding for the district. And the bill has uh, also funding for other local priorities, including $27.5 million for nuclear waste disposal efforts at the Department of Energy, $35 million for the Border Water Infrastructure Program, and $1.6 billion for the Impact Aid Program, which supports K-12 schools serving children in military families, such as those at San Onofre Elementary and Mary Fay Elementary. Finally, thinking about our military, thinking about our veterans. I wanna talk for a minute about how we are delivering for our veterans. I'm honored to continue to serve as vice chairman of the House Veterans Affairs Committee and the chair of the subcommittee on economic opportunity, where I have jurisdiction over things like veteran homelessness and employment and the GI Bill and transition assistance. It's an area where we've made great bipartisan progress and a number of my bipartisan bills are now the law of the land. The legislation that we've gotten from both President Biden and President Trump uh, to sign in the law has enhanced veterans' health care, education, housing, job prospects. We've ensured that tens of thousands of grievously injured veterans have access to adaptive technologies to improve our lives. And we're doing everything possible to get our veterans hardest hit by the pandemic back into the workforce. I'm also proud to represent Marine Corps Base Camp Pendleton, where we've gotten uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in the last couple of years to dramatically upgrade facilities at the base and to provide a pay raise for the men and women who serve. Uh, and uh, I'm very proud also, just a, a couple of weeks ago, I got invited to the Oval Office for a bill signing where President Biden uh, signed into law $230 million for the VA San Diego for its new spinal cord and community uh, facility. I'm so, so excited about that project. I can't wait uh, for the ribbon cutting and, and to really see uh, uh, how uh, those funds are spent for a state-of-the-art spinal cord injury center. And uh, I'm very grateful for our continued partnership uh, with Dr. Smith and everybody at the VA in San Diego. What we're gonna continue to do also is work with the county of San Diego and the county of Orange. Uh, and we have something called the CVSO Act, the, the County Veteran Servicers uh, uh, Organizations and officers that uh, support our veterans at the county level, getting them funding, $50 million a year, so they can continue to enhance and improve upon the, the efforts, the outreach efforts, the promotion efforts of all the veterans benefits in San Diego and Orange County. We're working on that as well. I hope we can get it across the finish line soon. And look, at the bottom, the, the end of the day, the bottom line is that we're gonna do everything we can on a bipartisan basis to provide the support, the resources necessary to treat our veterans with the same dignity, the same honor that they have treated our country. It's the very least we can do, and it will always be a bipartisan effort as long as I am serving in the House of Representatives and working on behalf of our veterans. So with that as background, I wanna turn now to Dr. LaCroix. And it really is my pleasure to welcome back 
uh, Dr. Andrea LaCroix. I think we've had you on several times. I've lost count, uh, but uh, probably uh, seven or eight or nine. And uh, you're always so enlightening and you, you uh, teach us the latest of what is happening with COVID-19. We were mentioning before uh, we began, we had a minute to speak, uh, that we were hoping by now that maybe we wouldn't have to be speaking as much about COVID as a crisis for our community. But because so many people have yet to be vaccinated, uh, because uh, unfortunately the vaccine is not available for very young children, and because of the, the uh, proliferation of the Delta variant and perhaps other variants, uh, we still now are in a position where we have to be, number one, meeting virtually. Uh, and I look forward to not having to meet virtually very, very soon. But number two, having COVID-19 as the focus of our conversation. For those that have not heard Dr. LaCroix, she is a distinguished professor and chief of epidemiology in the Department of Family Medicine and Public Health at UC San Diego. She's also the director of the Women's Health Center of Excellence at UCSD, and she's an expert on long-term observational studies and randomized clinical trials to identify preventative interventions that improve our prospects for health aging. She received her doctoral degree in epidemiology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Dr. LaCroix, it's great to see you, and I'll turn it over to you for some introductory comments. Thank you so much, Congressman Levin. It's inspirational to hear all that you're getting done in Washington and all that you're getting done for our veterans, especially inspirational. I, I think the only thing I would say in opening today is um, we thought in mid-June that this summer would be a free and clear kind of summer, although we knew we were in a race against the Delta variant to vaccinate as many people as possible. And the Delta variant has shown us uh, what it might look like when we encounter a new variant going forward. I know we're gonna talk about that a lot today. I would just add two things to what you've already said that are really our biggest threats to democracy and even, even to fighting pandemics. And that those two things are the pandemic of misinformation. You must be hearing from people in your communities as I do um, some really wild stories about what vaccination might do to you, um, you know, um, all kinds of wild stories. I, you know, I think um, that the pandemic of misinformation that we've talked about time and time again during the pandemic is one of our biggest enemies in getting the pandemic behind us. And then the other thing I would say is a threat to our democracy is the increasing amount of effort that's being put towards legislation in certain states to limit the access of voting. I think we need to fight that very hard. Um, we must elect people that will um, protect public health, that will protect our economic um, and social well-being in this country. And I see the attacks on voting access as being very serious as well. Um, and with that, I mean, I know we're going to talk about uh, COVID and the Delta variant, so I won't say more now. Well, thank you so much for those comments. And I certainly share your concerns around voting rights. And I know when I get back to Washington on the 23rd, we're going to be considering, I hope, uh, the John Lewis Voting Rights Advancement Act. I also hope that the Senate uh, will uh, find a path forward on H.R. 1, uh, the For the People Act that we sent them, that we passed both in the 116th and the 117th Congress. Uh, and I'm hopeful that Joe Manchin can find a path forward, perhaps with some uh, bipartisan uh, uh, support. Uh, to advance some alternate proposal on voting rights that can be taken up by the Senate. Uh, but uh, I share your frustration. I think it's, I think that's a fair statement. We've got a lot of questions. I want to get to as many as we can, and I'll start with Cynthia in Encinitas. And uh, frankly, I could ask this question on behalf of my wife and I as well, uh, because we have a uh, similar concern. School is about to start, and I'm worried, this is Cynthia now, and I'm worried that my young school-age kids uh, what about the risk to children? How can parents protect them if they aren't eligible for a vaccine? And uh, I said I could relate to this one, doctor, uh, with a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old that are supposed to start school on Tuesday. I guess I would just ask also, when do you think the vaccine will become available to children under 12 uh, years old? Well, thank you. I, I think uh, what I hear is that they're trying to get the vaccine out to kids this fall. Um, and, and that it would go before the FDA towards the end of September. They have to have the data on, you know, dosing and efficacy and safety in kids before they ask the FDA to approve it. And we, we certainly don't 
want to give it to children until we know exactly uh, all that all that evidence. Um, but it is a hard time right now uh, to send your kids back to school, knowing that um, they're not protected and that uh, there's so much acrimony in school about vaccination versus not vaccination. But I do think, isn't it the case, Congressman Levin, that um, in California public schools, teachers and staff must be vaccinated or tested, right? Yes. The, I guess the only wrinkle there is that the vaccination, I think they have until October 15th to get vaccinated. So there yeah. is a, uh, you know, a bit of a lag there between uh, the middle of August and the middle of October, uh, where, you know, the younger children won't have uh, the vaccine and the teachers may or may not have already been vaccinated. So hopefully it all works out. I think that, uh, you know, all that I know from uh, our uh, teachers locally is they're trying to be responsible and do the right thing by our students. And I think uh, that's what most of the parents want to see happen as well. Fortunately, I was reading about California versus other states today. Our children have fared much better than in other states. Very few of them have died, uh, although one too many is too many. And um, we don't want any children to die because of COVID. So it's been a very low rate of serious infections. Um, children tend to get um, less severe infections when they're infected because they don't have the ACE2 um, receptors that uh, tend to drive infection rates up. And um, so I think in general, I would have my kids in, in school this fall, but I would have them wearing masks probably uh, until the rate. I, I personally think it's not even enough right now that the teachers and the staff are vaccinated and the kids get vaccinated eventually. I just think we need to have the infection rates lower in our community. So they're already up again to between in San Diego County, eight and 9% test positive rate. That's too high. We need to be back under, uh, as we've always been saying here, under 2% would be much better. Um, you know, we would be back in the in the purple tier if we were in, under the color coded system again right now. So I think having the kids in school wearing masks and if they do get sick, uh, being very attentive to their symptoms and if they're having trouble trouble breathing, get, getting them into healthcare as soon as possible. But let's hope um, that, you know, sc schools that have done the mitigation strategies, even without vaccination, have done very well. And we should keep in mind that it is possible in school for the children to be safe, even, during, even without vaccination. And with vaccination, I think we can really keep them safe. I do think they should be wearing a mask until our infection rates are much lower. Very good. Well, our, our two kids have been quite uh, receptive about uh, wearing masks and, and have done a good job with that. And hopefully many uh, kids will uh, be able to do that as well. Uh, here's another question for you from Susan in San Diego, uh, who says, I keep reading that herd immunity can be achieved by allowing the virus to run wild through our communities. I've been seeing people much, or I've been seeing much commentary pleading to have everything opened up for people supposedly not worried about the virus well, telling those who are worried that they can stay home and isolate. Please explain why this is a bad idea and will not end the pandemic, as some seem to believe. Well, thank you for that question, Susan. Um, we've been hearing, you know, about that sort of Sweden strategy since the beginning of the pandemic, where they really didn't uh, do any mitigation strategies. And they had a much higher rate of death in Sweden than in other European countries. And um, they, their epidemiologists admit now that that wasn't a great strategy for the Swedish public because so many people died. It's really people dying uh, that's the argument against um, taking no precautions, doing no mitigation. So herd immunity, again, I view it as a continuous variable. The more we're vaccinated, uh, the less the virus can jump from person to person. But we now have Delta variant um, that is so transmissible that even people who are vaccinated can get viral particles in their upper respiratory tract. So the top of your throat and in your nose and the virus then, so it's twice as communicable, twice as infectious as the alpha variant that we started with. Once these particles are in your nose and throat, they replicate a thousand times faster than the old variants. That means that even if you're vaccinated, you can have a lot of viral replication in your upper respiratory tract. And yet I do wanna say that, you know, 
there's far less disease being transmitted by vaccinated people than unvaccinated people. And um, in fact, in San Diego County, if you go to the if you go to the health department website, you'll see the rates of infection, just Delta infection, uh, overall COVID infection by vaccination status. And in people that have gotten uh, Moderna or Pfizer, the rate of infection is less than 2%. In people that have gotten Johnson & Johnson, it's about 2%. And in people, and I may have the, uh, the, the percent may be 10,000 or something like that, but um, we'll pay attention to the, what we call the numerators for now. And then in the, in the group of people that haven't been vaccinated at all, the rate was 23. So 23 versus two or one, hugely different rates of infection. So that's a long way of saying we don't, you know, a, a new variant can come along and absolutely, we had a bit of herd immunity in mid-June before the Delta variant was prominent. There was very little virus circulating, um, but we knew Delta was starting to move in. And um, Delta, even, even if we had herd immunity for previous variants, Delta makes it much harder to get there. So now they're saying we would have to have something like 85 to 90% of people vaccinated to really get to herd immunity for Delta, somewhat of a move, moving target. Um, and we're gonna have to be paying attention to, to variants really probably for the rest of our lives. I, I, I'm not gonna lie to you, um, COVID's gonna be around, there's gonna be variants and we're gonna be hearing about this in the news. We just hope that it's not at a pandemic level around the world in the future, and that we can very quickly respond to new variants like we do with the flu and get boosters out to people so that the impact of these variants is as low as possible. Thank you very much for that. Turning uh, to a different topic, Stacy in Oceanside uh, writes, my family lives not too far from the shutdown San Onofre power plant. And until we saw you on the Lawrence O'Donnell show, we had no idea that all the nuclear rods were still on the premises. Can you explain where we are in the removal process? Thank you for working on this extremely important issue. Well, Stacy, I too live pretty close to the Song's uh, site, about 10 miles away. Uh, and you're right, the uh, spent fuel rods are still there on site, uh, and they're going to be there for quite some time until we've got a place where they can be transported to. Uh, now, you may or may not be familiar uh, with some of the past efforts, but over the last several decades, the federal government has been engaged in uh, the Yucca Mountain Project in Nevada and a number of other projects as well. But we still lack either a geologic repository or a consolidated interim storage site for the nation's spent nuclear fuel. There are about 80 sites, commercial reactor sites across 34 states that have this fuel. Uh, and uh, that is the, the big problem, and, and the, the problem did not appear overnight. It won't go away overnight, but please do know that we are working to address it uh, pretty much every day that I'm serving in Congress for, for as long as I had the honor to serve in Congress. According to Edison and their, Southern California Edison and their decommissioning plan for the site, uh, the earliest that they expect to finish fuel transferring off-site is 2049. 2049. And I'd like to do all I can to cut as many years as possible off of that number. Uh, one of the things that we have advanced is something called the Spent Fuel Prioritization Act, which says for all the nation's nuclear waste, move the waste first from those sites with the highest seismic risk and the highest population density. San Onofre is at the top of that list. We've got 8 million people within 50 miles. We've got two active earthquake faults as well as inactive earthquake faults, not to mention rising sea levels adjacent to the site. So from an environmental perspective, Songs is at a higher risk and therefore the waste should be moved first. Uh, right now, the way it works is the oldest waste is moved first once we find a place for it to move. Uh, and uh, that puts San Onofre somewhere in the middle. Um, the other thing I'll mention uh, is the creation of this caucus, the Spent Nuclear Fuel Solutions Caucus, I think is vital to get a new generation of members of Congress and policymakers engaged in this topic. It should not be a partisan matter. There are Republicans and Democrats alike that have spent nuclear fuel challenges in their district. We're going to do everything we can to try to move uh, the needle on this, make it a top federal priority, continue to remind the Biden administration, the Department of Energy, 
the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Environmental Protection Agency, and other relevant agencies of the need uh, to address the issue and to advance solutions, both uh, permanent and interim solutions. And so it's all hands on deck, all systems go. We've got a great group of community activists. We put together a task force uh, when I started and they made a number of great recommendations to us. And now we're moving forward on many of those recommendations. One of which, by the way, was the creation of the Spent Nuclear Fuel Solutions Caucus. So much more to come. If you go to our website, you can uh, get more information on the Spent Fuel Solutions Caucus and everything that we're doing on the issue. But I thank you very, very much for the question. And we're going to do all, all we can to make our voice heard and get the waste off the coast as quickly and as safely as we possibly can. Next, I'll go back to you, Dr. LaCroix. This is from Stanley in San Clemente, who has a stunningly, actually two stunningly simple questions. When should I wear a mask and should I upgrade my mask? Good question. You know, you'd be legitimately confused if you listen to all the news coming out on that topic. I mean, we were told by the CDC a few weeks ago, if you were vaccinated, you really didn't wear, need to wear a mask. And now we know that um, now we know that there is some infection rate in vaccinated people. So I'll tell you what I do um, and what's being recommended. I'm wearing a mask again, actually never stopped uh, when I go into grocery stores. And uh, just out of respect, uh, I don't know, you know, I'm not close to other people, but I, I want to protect the grocery store workers. And I, I see about half and half masking uh, down here in Encinitas right now. I just want to make sure that I'm not the one uh, spreading any viral particles around and that any that are being spread uh, are not coming home with me. Um, I'm also masking whenever I'm inside. Um, at UCSD, when we go back to school in the fall, there's a rule that we'll mask inside unless we're in our offices with the door closed. Um, and, and even then, I'm, I'm thinking uh, with our ventilation systems not being the greatest, um, I'm quite sure that, uh, that the, you know, we've seen, we have data that people, um, you know, during the height of the pandemic, were in different offices and we're still able to infect each other. So when you're inside, I think we should be masked just like the kids in school. Um, I do not eat inside of restaurants. I think that I eat outside. Um, so we're lucky to live in a place that where we can enjoy eating outside at restaurants. And I would not feel I, I say that, but I ate at the French Cafe in Carlsbad today, um, which is a lovely place, by the way, I've never been there before. And there were no seats outside. So we sat, you know, in a in a side of the restaurant next to the door. There was plenty of air coming in and we took off our masks to eat and enjoyed ourselves really in in isolation. That's almost like eating outside. So, um, but I really prefer to be outside because I think it's very, very hard to um, be infected outside. Should you upgrade your mask? Um, if you're gonna be doing something like sitting on an airplane for several hours, like Congress Levin has to do, I would highly recommend a high quality medical mask like a KN95. They say N95, but you know those are hard to get. They're used in the hospital and they're pretty uncomfortable. But I think um, you see a lot of KN95 masks out there and I think they're very effective. It's also uh, possible if you're on an airplane or an enclosed space like that to just use a surgical mask uh, underneath a cloth mask like we saw during the Biden inauguration. That's very, very effective. And um, a lot of people had sort of thought we were out of the masking business. So I saw this week that mask sales were up again. Um, you know, have some masks around. We're going to be wanting to mask for, you know, the foreseeable future at certain times. I did also see um, one of the uh, one of the aerosol experts and the guy from Dartmouth who um, who studies aerosol transmission of COVID and. He said that um, people were usefully doing things now like buying home test kits and just testing themselves for virus before they leave the house in the morning. This, I think, we've talked about this before, but I actually think when that strategy gets affordable, that might be something we do. And we might even be testing for more than just COVID. We might be testing for influenza and other viruses. So like you brush your teeth in the morning, you might be you know, swabbing your nose and finding out if you should be out in public that day. So it's going to be a whole new world. And um, 
all these technologies will be helpful to us. But, you know, uh, not masking outside is fine, uh, especially if you're vaccinated. Uh, upgrade your mask if you're going to be on a plane. Uh, simple cloth masks are fine for the grocery store. And um, I would just go more high quality if I was going to be inside. Thank you for that. Um, Alicia in Carlsbad asks, uh, this is for me, uh, how will you help save the ACA? How can you help with health care if we do get the ACA taken away? How can you help women get equal treatment in health care? Uh, thanks from an advocate, survivor, and fighter for women with rare diseases and invisible illnesses. Well, Alicia, let me begin by saying that as long as I have the opportunity to serve and as long as we have the gavel and are in the majority in the House of Representatives and in the Senate, uh, we are going to do all we can to protect and fight to expand quality and affordable health care for everyone in this country. And when it comes to the Affordable Care Act itself, uh, as I mentioned at the outset, under the American Rescue Plan, uh, we made some significant improvements, enhancements uh, to the ACA to the extent to where a lot more people can get very, very affordable health care plans. We now have uh, over 31 million Americans uh, that are enrolled in uh, plans under the Affordable Care Act, about 1.6 million in California alone. And there's about 2 million that have signed up since President Biden has taken uh, office in the last several months. It's a record high. The 31 million is a record high for the ACA. But we still have a long way to go to make sure that everyone that's eligible and that can uh, get care for, very in a, for a very affordable price, like I said, a dollar a month for a lot of people in California, actually go and sign up. So I encourage you to go to CoveragedCA.com uh, to do that. Now, these uh, premiums, keeping the premiums low, keeping the costs low, uh, as we did under the American Rescue Plan, we have language in our budget reconciliation bill to make those uh, advances permanent. And it's my belief that we need to learn from the pandemic and to the extent we've seen gaps in our safety net, whether it be the tens of millions without health care or the tens of millions without paid leave or without access to broadband um, or the millions and millions of children in the United States who are uh, at risk of going hungry. We've got to do everything we can to try to narrow or close those gaps entirely. Uh, we've got to uh, ensure that every single person in this country has access to quality and affordable health care, full stop. I'm also a very strong supporter of uh, constitutional rights of women to make their own reproductive health care decisions. Just a few, thing, few things that we've uh, supported. Legislation to ensure veterans receive the same access to free contraceptives that are already available to other Americans. A bill to ensure that all women, regardless of income, race, or geography, have access to reproductive health care. The Women's Health Protection Act to prohibit laws that create unnecessary barriers to reproductive health services, such as requiring doctors to conduct tests and procedures that are medically unnecessary. Uh, and the Black Maternal Health Momnibus Act, which directs multi-agency efforts to improve maternal health, particularly among racial and ethnic minority groups, veterans, and other vulnerable populations. So we'll do all we can around health access and health equity. So I thank you very, very much for the question, Alicia. And here's one for you, doctor. This is from Sid in Ladera Ranch. What's the risk of hanging out with my vaccinated friends and family? And presumably Sid is vaccinated himself, I hope. I think the risk is low hanging out with vaccinated friends and family. And the only exception would be if you have a family member who's immune compromised um, and who would get very sick if they if they got uh, Delta. So as long as everyone's feeling well and um, doesn't have symptoms of COVID, hanging out with vaccinated friends and family is extremely low risk. And I think I will just leave it at that. Here's another uh, related question from Eve in San Diego, who asked, when should we expect those over 65 to need booster shots? We were in, she says we received both doses of the Pfizer vaccine about six months ago. That is an, that is an emerging question. And I, I think if you have me back in a month or two, we might have an answer. The, the data that's coming out of Israel, um, and they're keeping track of this, but Israel vaccinated almost the whole population very, very quickly in January. So they now have people that are past the six month point. And um, studies are coming out showing that at least the level of antibodies goes down after six months. 
Um, but we're also paying attention to just how much infection occurs because there's besides antibodies, there's an immune response that protects us. And so we know that just looking at the changes in antibodies, which is totally normal, is um, you know not the only measure of our immunity to uh, spreading COVID. So I really look forward to having a more definable, no, more definitive answer on that topic. And I do think we'll be getting boosters you know, between six and 12 months just to boost our immunity and also to kind of fine tune that booster to whatever variants are circulating in our communities at the time. Thank you for that. Uh, Bruce in Oceanside says, well, I'm happy to see that the Senate passed the bipartisan infrastructure bill. He says, Lord knows we need it. I agree, Bruce. Can you explain to me what the deal is with the reconciliation bill and why the House insists on voting on them both at the same time? Thank you. Well, um, you are correct that uh, we are at a bit of a stalemate right now. We have what, what the speaker and what Leader Schumer has called a two-track process. So the bipartisan infrastructure bill is about a trillion dollar bill, of which about $550 billion is new spending. It's on what we could call hard infrastructure, roads, bridges, water, um, broadband, things like that. And then you have the other three and a half trillion dollar uh, budget bill, which you could call the reconciliation bill. Some people are referring, it, referring to it as the mega bill just because of the sheer size. And that includes lots of other things, uh, including some climate related uh, provisions like uh, tax credits for electric vehicles and for solar and for battery storage, um, like um, additional funds for paid family leave and free community college, uh, the expansion of those Affordable Care Act premiums that I mentioned, expansion of the uh, middle-class tax cut through the child tax credit. Um, so there's a whole host of things in that reconciliation bill that are really, really important also uh, that we did not unfortunately get in as part of the bipartisan uh, deal. So the idea is as follows. For the bipartisan deal, they needed 60 votes in the Senate to overcome the filibuster, it got 69. It passed 69 to 30, and it was sent to the House. Uh, in the House, you probably have about, I don't know, 30 or 40 members of the House, uh, the, the furthest left members of the House that have said that they will not vote to advance that bipartisan bill unless and until uh, the uh, reconciliation mega bill is advanced. Now, the other day, we have eight members uh, in the middle of the Democratic House, caucus, uh, House Democratic Caucus, who said they will not advance the mega bill unless the bipartisan bill is passed first. So what I have said and what I'll continue to say is that we need now more than ever to stay together. We need to stay together because we've got to get those 30 or some uh, to uh, on the left to advance the bipartisan bill, and we've got to get those eight or so in the middle to advance the uh, mega bill. Knowing that the mega bill will also have to be uh, approved by the Senate, which means that Joe Manchin and Kirsten Cinema and others in the middle of the road will need to approve of that bill. And in so doing, that bill will probably be whittled down to a point where those moderate House members uh, will be more comfortable with it. So let's stick together. And if I were President Biden right now, I would personally call all eight of those members because the Speaker wants to move the uh, the uh, budget bill, the mega bill first, the resolution for the mega bill first, uh, that's that's the order that it's going in. And I would uh, emphasize speaking to those eight people first to get them on board. But make no mistake, if it were an up or down vote only for the uh, bipartisan bill, uh, there is a very real chance that it would not pass uh, because uh, the, uh, by, the uh, mega bill has not been advanced uh, yet by the House. The resolution was approved by the Senate on a party line vote the other day, uh, although Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin have both said that they want to see that three and a half trillion dollar top line figure pared down substantially uh, before it comes to fruition. So the bottom line, the word of the day, unity, unity. If we can stick together, we'll get both done. If we are not together, uh, then we'll get neither. And uh, that will be a horrible, horrible outcome uh, for all Americans, including for all of us in this district, where we will see huge benefits from both the bipartisan bill and from the reconciliation bill. It's complicated. I hope that makes sense. 
And uh, thank you very much for the question, Bruce. Leonard in San Clemente uh, asks, a while back, you said that the OC sheriffs needed additional funding for body cameras. Was there money in the American Rescue Plan for the cameras? And was there additional funding for local law enforcement overall? What is your position? Well, first of all, let me say that um, I was encouraged that the Orange County Sheriff is going to move forward on those body cameras. They announced that recently. But make no mistake, I support more funding uh, for our local law enforcement, and particularly when it comes to things like body cams and dash cams. I'm doing all I can, in fact, uh, to get funding for the city of Oceanside specifically uh, for uh, the dash cams that, that they want to see. Uh, and, um, you know, I hope that we'll have some good news in that regard in the coming weeks uh, as well. The American Rescue Plan, it really did contain a lot of funds to help keep essential workers on the job. Uh, and that included first responders like our police officers. In fact, cities in the 49th District receive $107.6 million total to support their essential workers and to maintain services and know that a portion of that funding went to our local law enforcement agencies, our local police departments that have been strained during the pandemic. And as I mentioned, uh, I uh, was able to secure $587,000 in funding from recent appropriations legislation for those dash cams in Oceanside for the Oceanside Police Department. And we're gonna do all we can to ensure that money goes from the House Appropriations Bill and actually is enacted and that uh, Oceanside receives those funds. So I'm gonna do all I can uh, to help uh, our local law enforcement uh, to, uh, to get them resources. I, do, I am not one that supports defunding. I never have, I never will. I support specific tactical reforms. I support more funding for things like community policing uh, to improve relations between law enforcement, to improve relations with communities of color, as well as funding to help diversify police departments. And I also support more funding for all of our other social services that we need in our public schools and other programs that we need to lift up underserved communities. So I thank you very much for that question, Leonard. Here's one for you, Dr. LaCroix. This is from Angela, another Angela uh, in, I think we've had two, in Del Mar. Uh, is it safe to travel? Should I skip the peanuts? Should I skip the water? Should I keep my mask on? Good questions. I, I wanted I want to disclose to all of you that I haven't been on an airplane since the start of the pandemic, but Congressman Levin, you have probably taken, what, 100 flights or something? Too many. I have not skipped the pretzels. They don't give peanuts anymore. They give pretzels, and I, I have eaten the pretzels. And you're okay. But you I haven't been infected. Up. Yes, yes. And so, I mean, I'm in an abundance of caution. If you're If you're super worried, you can avoid flying, as I have, but I think even for me, that that phase is coming to an end. I'm ready to go some places. I'm ready to go see my children. I'm ready to spend some uh, time with friends. So um, I think airplanes are, you know, not as safe as being outside, but reasonably safe. We do know that, and I've heard many stories, and you probably have too, that people who know they have COVID infections are flying on airplanes. It's so important to wear a mask. Um, and to have a good mask on or two masks if you uh, if you need to, if you don't have a KN95 or an N95 mask, I would wear two while you're on the airplane and just, you know, try to not take it off as much as possible. I just had a friend who flew back from Denver to Seattle and she was sitting next to someone who didn't want to wear, wear their mask. And so he just kept ordering drinks and food and was unmasked right beside her the entire time. And she was really nervous about that. Um, she kept her mask on. Um, I think that is kind of the worst case scenario that we talk about. And um, what that is the risk you take when you fly. The plane may be packed. You may be next to someone who doesn't want to wear a mask. And you're going to have to deal with it by just keeping yourself, you know, I think for those of you that don't wear glasses, having your eyes covered is also super important, either through a mask or just wear your sunglasses on the plane. Keep the eyes covered because it's another mucous membrane. And if people are talking next to you, it's just super easy for the droplets from speaking, from sneezing, from coughing to make their way over to your eyes. But reasonably safe to fly, especially if you're vaccinated, of course, if you're vaccinated, because even if you get infected, it's very, very unlikely that 
you will be in the hospital or in the situation of fatal disease. So I would say mostly yes, <laughs> with a well, lot of epidemiologic precautions. Let me uh, just take this opportunity to commend United Airlines as well on ensuring that all of its employees are fully vaccinated. I just saw the CEO of United Airlines on PBS uh, last night or two nights ago, and I was so encouraged by that. I take United uh, twice a week, 10 hours a week, usually back and forth, five and five. I've been doing that the entirety of the pandemic, except for maybe a month or so at the beginning or six weeks at the beginning where we didn't. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, my hat's off to all of the flight attendants and the people who have made that a reality. And I've been so impressed with uh, uh, the folks at uh, our airports. I, I fly through San Diego and, and uh, the folks there have done a uh, really terrific job as well. And, and I commend them for all they've done. Uh, and uh, look, you know, for those like myself, it's not been an option uh, to uh, not a realistic one, in my view, to to uh, uh, to to not travel. And uh, we've just had to do the very best to keep ourselves safe. Uh, but I do occasionally have the pretzels on the airplane. I admit it. I admit it. Um, <laughs> here's another one for you. Can I hug and visit with older relatives? What about unvaccinated children? And again, this presumes the person asking the question is vaccinated. Yeah, the person asking the question is vaccinated. Again, we're going to hear stories. I just heard one of a family where all the adults were vaccinated um, and there was an outbreak of COVID in the children, po possibly because the vaccinated adults had some Delta exposure or one of the kids didn't know they had it, but um, they were vacationing together and they spread it to the other children. We're going to hear stories like that uh, because they're true. Um, I definitely think it's safe to hug older relatives, though, if you have an older relative who's immune compromised and hasn't gotten a booster or um, is very frail, um, you know, I, you know, I would probably still hug them, but I might have my mask on to do it. The other thing you can do, though, and this is Dr. Bromage, Bromage from Dartmouth, is say, is take a home, take a home COVID test before you go to the party or before you see your older relative. And then if everybody has had a test just before they get together, you can really hug and, and uh, enjoy each other freely. I did go to a party across the street last weekend, 60th birthday party for a neighbor. Um, lots of people there, uh, out, it was an outdoor party. Everybody wanted to shake hands and hug. And I was definitely doing the I, you know, I was definitely doing the elbow bump instead of the hugging of strangers. So I, you know, we all have, uh, we all have our tolerances for risk and I just choose not to take unnecessary risks and you should feel free to live your life, you know, the way you want to as well. So that's my story on that. Here's one from Marcy in Rancho Santa Margarita who says, I received my first child tax credit and I'm very grateful to have received it. Can you explain how it will work? Is it based on the fact that I fall into a lower income uh, bracket? Well, Marcy, first of all, uh, you uh, should now have gotten your second advance payment uh, yesterday through the American Rescue Plan. They started arriving in bank accounts on July 15th. They'll continue to arrive every month until the end of the year. Uh, and these are, again, incredibly significant middle class tax cuts for families with children. They'll bring crucial relief uh, for those who've been overwhelmed by childcare costs, which we know have been incredibly expensive and rising in cost. And so July through December, $300 per month for each child below the age of six, $250 per month for each child between the ages of seven and 17. Single parents who earn up to $75,000 per year and couples who earn up to $150,000 per year are eligible for the maximum Payments will begin automatically or have begun automatically for those who have filed a tax return for 2020 or for 2019, or if you signed up and received a stimulus payment under the American Rescue Plan um, or um, uh, the CARES Act last year, you should be automatically eligible. For those that didn't file tax returns or, or haven't uh, registered, go to the IRS website, irs.gov. You create an account really, really uh, quickly. And look, again, 125,000 in our, in our children in our district alone will be eligible for this. 10,300 children in our district alone lifted out of poverty 
a huge, huge deal uh, that could get an average benefit, an average benefit uh, that will make a big difference every month uh, for the rest of the year. And my hope is that we secure this middle class tax cut, not just through the end of the year, but that we do it uh, in future years as well. And we're going to be advocating to do that as part of our reconciliation bill, that mega bill that I referenced earlier. Here's one for you from Gary in Carlsbad. Do unvaccinated people infected with the Delta variant show higher viral loads than we see with other variants? And what about vaccinated people? Do they also have higher viral loads even if they have no symptoms? Yes, they have higher viral loads and it's, it's incredibly remarkable. So um, reports suggest that unvaccinated people infected with the Delta variant have roughly a thousand fold higher viral load than the earlier variants of SARS-CoV-2. Um, and even if you're vaccinated, um, the viral loads are much higher than with previous variants. I don't know if they're a thousand times higher, um, but what I'm seeing is five or six times higher in people that are vaccinated. And it, it just because it replicates so fast, it's a very fast virus. What about, um, so, so these higher viral loads are what's contributing to the much greater um, contagion or transmissibility of the Delta variant. And I think it's remarkable, and, and maybe I should make it a policy on these questions to end with something good, because there is a lot of good to be taken away from all these questions. It's remarkable that, our, that we have a vaccine and that the vaccines that we have have been remarkably effective at reducing the impact of a variant like Delta on our society. We can see it's running rampant in unvaccinated places, but in places with greater vaccination rates, we've really, uh, we've really done very well at keeping Delta from having a terrible impact on us. Um, and I'm, I'm extremely grateful uh, for that and for the, for our country, uh, you know, for, uh, everything that's been done to make these vaccines available to every American free of charge. Thank you for that. And I have one on the environment uh, and specifically desalination. This is from Tony in Capistrano Beach, who writes, well, I appreciate the dire need to address drought and water shortages. I'm increasingly disturbed by the high cost and serious environmental impacts uh, of desalination, a huge energy hungry technology. Is it possible instead to look into less sexy, but also much cheaper and less harmful conservation, recycling and reuse technologies? I would say a couple of things. First, the answer is yes. So desalination is not going to solve all of our uh, water shortage issues. We obviously need to look in th into things like recycling, which needs to be a far larger piece of the puzzle. However, what I've introduced is legislation that would uh, advance funds, federal funds, federal support, for desalination projects that emphasize, number one, renewable energy, uh, number two, uh, the absolute best uh, technology when it comes to uh, minimizing impact on marine life, uh, and number three, energy efficiency. Uh, what I am told by people in the industry, by people who are knowledgeable about this, is that we are very close to being able to do fully renewable, using fully renewable uh, electricity for uh, desalination, meaning things like solar, wind, uh, coupled with batteries, it, it now will pencil and can be done at a uh, cost that is comparable to uh, what desal projects have had to pay for grid electricity. Uh, so I think that that's right around the corner. Just the same, if you look at what is being done, uh, for example, Doheny is doing the slant well drilling where they're going deep beneath the ocean floor. Uh, my hope, my expectation is that uh, that too uh, will be a, uh, a real breakthrough when it comes to environmental impact. The reality is this, we need water. We are running out of water in Southern California and we need to do everything we can uh, to learn from those around the world. And I look at places like Israel, we talked about Israel, uh, Dr. LaCroix mentioned with regard to vaccines. They also have done a phenomenal job at water recycling and at water desalination. And we can learn a whole lot from them. Um, I visited desal plants there. You know, we have the largest desal plant in the Western Hemisphere in Carlsbad, the Bud Lewis plant, 50 million gallons a day, going to be 60 million gallons. It uses Israeli technology. And if the, the Bud Lewis plant were in Israel, it would rank number eight uh, in terms of the plants in Israel. So, and that, as for a, a nation of 9 million people, there's a lot we can learn, a lot of innovation, 
In our bill, the Desalination Development Act, 260 million for projects with the lowest environmental footprint and also for projects in the highest drought prone areas. So part of the portfolio, part of a resilient water supply and use the best environmental standards and continuously improve upon uh, the, the state of the art. So that's where I'm at uh, with regard. And, and obviously you always have to give the, the highest uh, regard to the local community. If they want those projects, if their local stakeholders want those projects, they will say so. If not, they will say that too. And I always respect the will of our local communities, not just when it comes to water, but when it comes to any of their, their local projects as well. We always want to do what is uh, reflected uh, from the will and the uh, support of the local community, the local elected officials, the local agencies that are responsible. I hope uh, that makes sense. And I thank you for the question, Tony. So uh, with that, doctor, I'd love to turn it back over to you if you have any, I guess, concluding thoughts, uh, words of encouragement, hopefully, uh, as we uh, uh, advance through the month of August here, advance towards Labor Day. Uh, I'd love to hear uh, some closing thoughts from you. Well, the most inspirational thought I uh, came across this week was my colleague, Joanne Trejo at UCSD, who's a uh, Vice Dean of uh, in the Health Sciences Office of Faculty Affairs. Her Twitter handle is inspirational to me. She she uses the word that you use, Congressman, which is unity. It's unity, decency, science, and yes, truth. So I leave you with those words: unity, decency, science, and yes, truth. Wow, I love it. And how do we follow her on Twitter? Uh, I think. Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, Joanne Trejo is her name, T-R-E-J-O. Right. And she's, she's an inspiration. And that Twitter handle is definitely an inspiration. Absolutely fantastic. Well, I want to thank you. You are an inspiration as well. And mm -hmm. I'm truly grateful to you for uh, always joining us and providing uh, your expertise and your knowledge. And I know we'll be having you on, uh, I hope, a lot more. And I hope eventually in person with a real group in person the way that we used to do these town halls every month, one a month, and we're going to get back to it. I want to thank uh, Ellen for all her great work, Ellen Montanari, in helping to arrange all of this, uh, as well as Jeremy, who does such a great job with our video uh, conferencing and our feed uh, on these, uh, our, our wonderful campaign team, Adam and Garrick, all of our uh, terrific folks uh, on the official side as well. And I really want to encourage, for those that are interested, I'm actually doing this town hall uh, this afternoon from our brand spanking new campaign office in Carlsbad. And uh, if you uh, are interested at all in volunteering, we would be so delighted to have you as a volunteer. You can go on our website at mikelevin.org. You can fill out a very uh, quick Google form and you can sign up to volunteer. And uh, there is no task too small or too great. We would love to see you. We would love to have your help uh, as we look to really uh, have a terrific ground game leading up into next November's election, 2022 election. Uh, just the same, uh, we love contributions. We, we are one of, uh, I think our campaign is one of around 50 or 60 in the House of Representatives that does not take corporate PAC contributions. We rely on individual uh, donors like yourself. The average contribution since I started running for Congress is $47. And we've had over 150,000 individuals uh, contribute. I'm very proud of that. You could do that as well at mikelevin.org. Uh, and, uh, you know, I would just say, please heed the public health recommendations. Uh, get vaccinated if you haven't done so. If you have anybody in your family, your network of friends or your colleagues, your neighbors, please, please, please just show them the data. The data is overwhelming. The data is obvious. And uh, I hope uh, that uh, maybe you could even play back uh, some of Dr. LaCroix's words for them from earlier in this uh, discussion. I want to thank my family, as always, for making this all possible. Uh, my wonderful wife and kids and in-laws and parents love you all very much. And until next time, stay safe, stay healthy, and thanks for tuning in. Thanks, everybody.